All right, everyone, welcome back to the Be Fit Podcast. I'm your host, Connor Murphy, here to talk to you about hard training. Now, I'm going to give you a whole background on, on why this is the topic that, that came to mind today. And it really, it relates back to kind of the OG days of CrossFit and how me personally have not necessarily straight away from the type of training, but kind of the, the understanding or how it was pushed or promoted on people. And I think I want to not fully steer the ship back in that direction, but, um, you know, I'm going to dive into it and then we'll, uh, I'm going to, you know, just get some of these thoughts out and then we can, we can let you create some thoughts behind it, um, for yourself. So currently, everyone knows CrossFit is infinitely scalable. And if you don't, then you can watch a single video on CrossFit's Instagram or CrossFit.com. And, or I can just break it down for you right now. There's functional movements. Functional movements are inherently safe. They're incredibly potent and they're universally scalable. There's all sorts of descriptive and then defining characteristic of that. But for just, for, just for purposes of this conversation, Everyone needs to squat. Everyone needs to deadlift. Everyone needs to press. And does everyone need to squat 500 pounds? Well, that'd be a better world we'd live in, but no, right? People just need to be able to sit down and stand up out of a chair. People need to be able to drop, or if people don't need to be able to drop something, people need to be able to pick it up if they drop something. And that's just as simple as a deadlift. The more capacity we have, the improved quality of our life is going to be the more we're capable of. Awesome. Now, when when CrossFit was first getting pushed out there, that all that stuff was known. CrossFit and, and, and Coach Glassman knew that he had the solution to a major problem, and it was that people were just training the wrong way. And up until, I mean, CrossFit.com in the first workout in, in, in 2001, uh, on, on CrossFit.com, you know, uh, Glassman was training in this, in this way and method for a long time before that. But... People didn't, people didn't do cardio and weights. People didn't do gymnastics and cardio and weights. It was this was the first thing that was combining it all together, and you know obviously gave a definition to it. But it just it just simply wasn't happening. And <clears throat> to get this message out there, it kind of started with this this police, this special operations, military, this like high operating person saying, hey, you're the, you're the tip of the spear here. We've got a program that can make you better. And I remember hearing stories about how Coach Glassman would go to different military bases or police forces, and he'd go with some of the, the OG fire breathers or stud athletes. Um, I remember hearing a story specifically about a man named Josh Everett, who is uh, also on the, the CrossFit uh, Level 1, Level 2 training staff, um, complete OG in the sport. And he would essentially go to these units and say, Hey, whatever your workout is, whatever like the, the test is, whatever's like your fitness or physical test, um, you know, your hardest workout, you're going to, you're going to do it and, and have your best time. And then I'm going to have my guy who's never done it, Josh Everett, do it against you. And he's going to beat you because the way that we're training is more beneficial than the way that you are training. And, and it happened and it happened all the time. And, and in this way of training this broad, general, inclusive, you know, uh, for a broad, general, inclusive capacity, Josh Everett, who was, you know, tip of the spear in CrossFit was able to just mop the floor in these workouts. So the, the first bit of it, it went to the top of the spear. We can make professional athletes fitter. We can make, you know, law enforcement, we can make um, operators in the military, all of these upper echelon people. And when I mean upper echelon, I mean, when when their body, it requires their body to operate at peak performance. And then it trickles down from there. And I think now we're at this, this level where it's like, well, CrossFit is for everyone. Now, I, you know, I program workouts for my parents who are doing CrossFit, who are both in their 60s. And, you know, they're crushing workouts and it's still hard, but it's not, it's not necessarily being pushed or promoted as this hardcore training regimen. And, you know, it used to be really prideful when you'd, you know, tear your hands up and there'd be, 
you know, you'd have to get like blood on the pull up bar because you were, you know, going hard or, you know, gripping the bar incorrectly, whatever it was, you know, and there was, you work out so hard that you were going to puke. And, you know, it's almost like that was straight away from it because people were like, oof, like, yeah, I don't necessarily know if I, if I need that in my life or if I want that in my life. And I think we found a more beneficial way to apply the program initially and then ramp people up to having a capacity uh, to perform these very difficult things. Whereas if it were to be that them trying to perform that at the start, <clears throat> then they tear their hands, then they're throwing up, then they're, you know, like, you know, all these, all these things where you're like, you know, CrossFit will mess you up because it will. And if you haven't done it before and you're training, you know, metabolic conditioning, you're doing constantly varied functional movement at high intensity for the first time or, you know, forever, then yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's extremely difficult. But, you know, the other day we had, I had a training session with some friends of mine that, that work in the, you know, the nightlife and dining industry. And we all went in for a workout. And I think the workout was, was we scaled it appropriately for them. Um, as far as the weights were concerned, as far as their comfortability with a power clean, and then also moving a barbell from the front rack into the back rack position. And I, and I think as the coach, as the person in, you know, putting the workout together, I think that the weights were scaled appropriately. However, the dose of intensity was, was pretty dang high. And it involved a shuttle sprint and then burpee box jump overs. And in the third round of this workout, so it was six rounds of a workout, in the third round, one of the guys comes up to me and he goes, hey, can I throw up in that trash can over there? And I was like, yeah, sure. He's like, okay, I think I'm going to do that. And the weirdest thing is that it was like calm. It wasn't like, I need to throw up in that trash can, like running over. It was just like like a, a collective conversation. Like, hey, uh, that trash can available for puke? And I'm like, well, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's not the desired thing that I'd like you to put in it, but that's, I would, that's where I would prefer you put that. Um, and so he goes over there and misses a round of the workout. He's just, ah, just calling dinosaurs, just screaming for him in this trash can. They didn't answer. However, afterwards, he kind of, you know, wiped off his mouth and finished the workout. He was crushed from the workout. And then, you know, 30, 45 minutes later, um, comes back to life, like, you know, just, wow, feeling good. Everything is good. And, and it's like scary to promote that now. Be like, this guy worked out so hard. He threw up because workouts with me are hard. That's not what I want everyone to do. But however, this person was probably an athlete at some point in time, was probably competitive in sports and has that drive and has that ability. And so not overloading him with weight or trying to make the workout so incredibly difficult that he's at a risk for injury. But yeah, maybe he pushed himself pretty dang hard into that threshold. That's not what I want to happen on every workout. But I'm like, man, you know, I should get back to being like this. Like, like if you're going to come train with us and you're going to you're going to do CrossFit, it's going to be hard. Now, I don't want you to throw up every time, but like like hard shit is going to happen. And and a, a workout previous to that in Charlestown at a new gym, uh, Alex, the, the old um, intern and then in, turned employee of Big Night Fitness, now is, uh, you know, is off, got set up doing his own thing, traveling around the world doing private training, um, which, by the way, is the fastest pathway that's ever happened to get from just starting off doing your CrossFit level one and then getting to that job. But, you know, if you're looking for work or an opportunity, this is where it happens. Anyways, so he's back in town. We're hanging out. The workout has um, chest bar pull-ups, heavy back squats, heavy power cleans in it. And both him and I tear our hands. Now, the reason why we tore our hands is probably because we have absolutely brand new equipment. And so everything is just, I mean, the knurling on the barbell is, you can feel it in there. There's not generations of DNA and skin built up in there taking away from kind of the grit of the barbell and the same with the pull-up rig. But, you know, little blister on this part of my hand right there. Yeah. Still there. It was like a week or so ago. And there was some blood on the bar and there was some like blood laying around. And, you know, there were some people that were in and out of the gym working in the production side of things. And you, you kind of get that look. It's like, oh, like, like, that's not for me. It's like, that's not the whole program. But listen, if you tear your hand a little bit and you bleed a little bit, it's okay. You're, you're, you're not going to die. 
And it shows that, you know, you were, you were doing something that, you know, maybe was challenging where your, where your body was at. It wasn't reckless. It wasn't like, Hey, you're going to do a thousand pull-ups when you're not capable of it. And you're, you know, you're unable to, to wash your hands or you're unable to operate for the next couple of weeks. But you know, a little hand tear here and there, maybe a little throw up depending on how much sleep you got or how much you drank the night before. It's like most of these training sessions are, are hard. Now, if you're going to make someone so sore that they can't walk for the next week, that's probably not appropriate. However, you know, dosing people with intensity, I, I think some people can handle it. And I think to get that demographic of, of people who have done hard things before and are willing to, I think it's important to push that on some people and to give them that drive, to let them know, hey, it's okay. Hey, you're not where you were at this point in time, but this is the fast track to get you there. And I, and I like that. And I think, I don't think that's where we, again, I don't think because the ship has turned towards, you know, longevity and fitness, maybe not turned. I think that's the way it was always going, but you know, maybe we were shooting some missiles over into the hardcore area. I don't, I don't think that's that big of an issue. You know, being too sore uh, and, and you know, going too hard on a workout. It's like you, and nowadays, I think I'm so afraid to program that to, to, to see if, if that can happen. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's probably appropriate 99% of the time operating on the side of caution, being judicious about, you know, how people are loading. But I think also you've been, someone's been training or they've been coming in, you want to set them free or you want to program a workout where you're like, Hey, this one's going to, this one's going to take you there. You know, I remember when I was, uh, I was training an athlete who, uh, was going into her freshman year. We've talked about it before in here, but her freshman year at Northeastern, uh, playing field hockey and she was all in. And the first few weeks, it was like, yeah, the workouts were hard, but they weren't anything that, you know, we're going to kill her. She was still going to be able to play her sport. And I remember there were a few times when, you know, when you're dosing intensity, the, the, the main reason why we like intensity is because it's, we can measure it, but really it's because it gets you results. You know, the, the hard things get you results and that's, it goes that way with everything in life. And there were a few workouts where I'm like, Hey, this one is going to put you in a dark place mentally on this one, your workout, it's going to suck. You're going to want to quit. You're going to think there's no way I'm going to finish this. All I want to do is rest. I don't want to get back on the true form and sprint. I don't want to do any more kettlebell swings. I don't want to do any more burpees. I don't want to do this anymore. And I briefed her on that. Hey, this is how you're going to feel. Just to let you know, this storm is coming. This wave is coming towards you. You can either know what's coming, which I almost think is better. What I hate is when I think I program, a, you know, a good workout and then halfway through, I'm like, oh no, oh no, I made a major, major mistake here. This is going to be miserable. Rather than saying, hey, this workout's going to be miserable. I'm here for it. I'm ready to do hard shit today because this is what's going to get me to that end goal. And you know what? This girl, she got to her end goal. Got a starting spot in varsity as a freshman. When she was worried she wasn't even going to make the team. And that's her effort and that's her hard work. And maybe that was part of my responsibility of pushing her to that level. Of programming workouts that were going to test her but were going to allow her to break through. <clears throat> if the hardest workout that you're ever going to have is in the actual event or sport that you are playing, you are probably not training properly for it. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a fair thing to say. If the most difficult workout or the most difficult physical exertion that you've ever had or that you're having is in the actual event where you're supposed to perform, you are not training properly. If you are training like an animal in your training sessions and preparing yourself for the absolute worst, that is only going to allow you to operate and optimize at a higher level during the game that you plan on or that you wish to be better at. 
doing the hard stuff in training. What is it? You know, there's that, that military saying that I hear all the time. It's like the more you the more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in battle. Eh, you know what I mean? Like you, we, we don't have to, you know, get a bunch of metaphors or similes to, to address this issue. It's like the stuff should be hard. And, and here's the thing too. I don't know. Sometimes I don't want to sound too hardcore. If you're not an athlete or you don't have something that you're doing in regular life where that's going to cause you to operate at the super high level, you should fucking train for it anyways. You should train for it anyways because it's going to make you a better person. It's going to make you a better athlete, whether you want to be or not. It's going to make you better at your job. It's going to make you better at dealing with adversity, at improvising, adapting, and overcoming obstacles. It is. It is, and I can tell you that because it has for me. And it has for any person that I've seen stick to a difficult program for a long period of time. That doesn't mean program the hardest workouts you've ever done. You know, I've seen people that are like, I'm going to do one hero workout every day for 365 days. I'm like, wow, that's, that's incredible. That's a very difficult achievement. I have friends that did Murph every day for a month. Um, do I think that's an optimal way to train? No, but I guarantee you, if you want to have the conversation with these people, I'll put you in touch with them. And they can tell you exactly what they learned on every single day of that. You want to know why? Because I'm willing to bet even on day two, you were like, I don't want to do this. On day three, on day 27, whatever it is, I'd prefer not to do this workout today, but I committed to it. So I'm going to get my ass up. I'm going to get to the gym and I'm going to perform this workout. After a month of doing that, let's say you don't sleep as well as you would have liked to but you wake up and you still have to get up and go to work, it makes that decision that much easier. Well, I would prefer not to go to work. I prefer to hit snooze and sleep for 45 more minutes. But you know what? I don't have to run one mile, do 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups, 300 squats, and run one mile afterwards. So this doesn't seem so bad. The harder you things to do, the more, the more capacity and adaptation that you have to that. You know, there's, it's that saying that it's all relative. And yes, we know that in fitness. Fitness is relative to your physiological and psychological tolerances. What do you, how hard are you willing to push here? And what is your body willing? What is the capability of your body? But, but that's in everything. It's all relative when, when you hear a, you know, let's say there's a 16-year-old boy and you know, his parents are purchasing him a car. And, and his life has been pretty kosher his, his whole life. Everything's been pretty good. He, you know, he works hard in school, you know, athlete, whatever you want, whatever you want the scenario to be. And he's never like really faced anything that, that, that hasn't been hard for him. And on his 16th birthday, he really wants to get a car. And the car that was given to him or not given to him wasn't what he wanted. And for him, he's like, that's a big deal. He may be complaining about that. He may be upset at that. If you are walking to work and you, you trip and you spill your coffee on the ground, and that's what ruins your day, odds are there hasn't been that much you know, adversity in your life. The thing that that's going to be the thing that offsets it. The first time that I ever saw death was absolutely devastating to me. Played over and over and over and over and over and over and over again in my head until I even changed what the story was. I changed how I saw it because of how many times I touched back on that memory and thought of things. And there are people that have experienced seeing or in the presence of death so many times that it doesn't affect them quite as much or it affects them differently because you learn how to deal with it. You can learn how to deal with it poorly or you can learn how to deal with it well. But that first time, right, the first cut is the deepest, all of those things. But the more you experience more, uh, more difficult things, the more seasoned, the more adversity someone's had in their life, probably the wiser they are. Now, let's not say, let's say, hey, let's all go out there and experience someone dying. Like, I don't mean it like that. That was just something relative that, that I felt in. And, and you, can, you can adapt from that with, with experiencing things that you've never done. There's going to be adaptation. 
And similarly, if you continually do the same thing every time, expect there to be no adaptation. If every single day I do 100 squats and it takes me three minutes to do it, at some point in time, probably pretty quickly, you will no longer have adaptation from that workout. 100 squats, three minutes. Boom, boom, boom. Great. At, at some point, you're going to have to do something else. You're going to have to do those same 100 squats, but maybe a little faster. Or you set the clock for three minutes and you try to do over 100 squats. That is how we increase our capacity. That is how we increase our capability. By making that thing that was at one point in time hard, making it a little bit harder. If you want to seek adaptation, you have to be able to do something that you haven't done before. That's what's so difficult when you have 9 million or an infinite amount of movements that you want to get better at. We have our 10 general physical skills, which is our, our cardiorespiratory or our cardiovascular endurance, stamina, strength, flexibility, speed, power, accuracy, agility, balance, and coordination. Those are all the adaptations that we want to get better at. But when you take those 10 things and apply it to every single skill, every skill and drill that you could possibly want to be good at, it makes it hard. So it's like every time, every time I have to put a bar on my back, I have to squat more. It's like, you just want to keep that adaptation going up, but it's not just for one rep. You got to, you got to do it again for a hundred. What's the heaviest weight you can back squat a hundred reps on? Blah, terrible. What's the heaviest you can do one? How fast can you do it? How slow can you do it in control? Do you have the static isometric contraction to hold the bottom of the squat? There's so many things that you can get better at. And by increasing the intensity, you will get more adaptation out of it. I feel like I kind of went on a, went on a side tangent over there. But really what, I'm, what this, this whole thing is about is it's okay to do hard things. And it's okay to slightly over-program a workout. It's okay to tear your hands it's okay to throw up after a workout or during for my man. But that shouldn't deter you from coming back for more. <laughs> Learning, hey, this is where the speed bobbles came up. Maybe I shouldn't have sprinted that shuttle run as fast as I could. And then I can make it the six rounds. And then maybe the next time you're like, hey, I'm going to try this the exact same thing again. You do it. You complete the whole workout. You didn't throw up. There's adaptation able to complete this entire workout in this time that was faster because I didn't spend time at the trash can yelling at it. And that's it. That was just kind of my thought process of what's on my mind today. And I need to, to push that out there. Hey, these, these workouts are hard. Yeah, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it. To, to, um, there's a quote that's been going around from an interview that um, my friend, as I always mentioned, James Hobart, I uh, was talking about on, um, on the morning chalk up, just very eloquently said, it's pretty much in a sentence, what James said, what it's taking me an hour to say, quote, here's the dirty secret. CrossFit never gets easier. You only get fitter. And then they start loading more weight on the bar and asking you to go faster. But the reason I've stuck around so long is the people. Right, it's the, it's the the community aspect. It's what he's talking about is sticking around. But you don't you don't get to complete CrossFit. You're not there's not a series of benchmark workouts. And he's like, I completed all these in the right times. CrossFit's done. No, then they're going to say, okay, do them all heavier or do them all faster. And that's kind of frustrating, right? Every single day having to just you know crush yourself. Some days more than others. We can talk about the programming side of it. But for James, what keeps him around is the affiliate model and is doing it with other people who are willing to work hard and make that sacrifice. If, if one, if all I did was CrossFit alone, it, it would look a lot different than how I do it, right? The intensity would be lower, but two, I probably wouldn't do it as long or as often because I don't have that camaraderie piece. Hurley in today's workout, Hurley and I trained this morning in today's workout, do you think you would have pushed as hard if you were alone in a garage by yourself? Absolutely not. Why is that? Why did you feel like you should move faster? Because I had to keep up with everybody else. Right. One, the, the competitive nature of it, which is, it's, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful in this way because 
Hurley's not like I'm no matter what I'm going to beat Connor on this workout and if I don't then I'm then I'm not doing it again. No, I and know that's not happening. <laughs> and our workouts were slightly different. He had a sandbag, I had a D-ball. We had we we I think it was all scaled appropriately. And it was scaled so appropriately that that we were competitive with each other. The workouts were a little different, but you're able to keep up. Mm -hmm. And what I see too is you're like, "Oh, yeah, Connor, I've been doing CrossFit for, you know, however many bajillion years." But when I finish the ski and you finish the ski and I see you put your hands on the handbag I'm like, or on the sandbag, I'm like, Hurley's putting out effort. I've got to put out effort. Everyone in here is working hard. If I'm going to sit there with my hands on my knees or be like, oh, that's enough of this workout for me. Now there's three other people that are still working hard. So I'm not just quitting on myself. I'm quitting on you guys. And here's the thing. No one, as much as you care about your own effort, no one cares about what you're doing. Yeah. Like I'm looking around, you know, like, like again, Jordy, every time I'm one of the other guys that we, that we train with, um, he is a, uh, he has made leaps and bounds over the last few years in a training aspect. He's been a professional athlete for a long time, but in the training aspect, I think he has made leaps and bounds, which has then helped him probably continue his career. I'd love to take credit for that, but that's all his hard work. But I mean, I, he was right next to me and I wanted to put out more effort, but I didn't really care about him. I just cared about what I was doing. And he was there because people will die for points competitively. And then at the end of it, it wasn't like, oh, you fucking idiot. You sucked at that workout. You only got three rounds and I got 10 rounds. It's like, no, that thought process never happened. It never happened for anyone. It was like, you went really hard. I went really hard. We're all exhausted on this. Let's do it again tomorrow. Yeah. And it sounds crazy, but it's like, that's how it works. And, and it's so cool to have everyone inspiring everyone. And it's because it's, it's, you work hard in, in gyms that force you to work hard in gyms that hold you accountable with how much weight, how far are you moving it? How fast did you do it? Write it down on the board that hold accountability in that. There's a reason why wallets don't go missing from those type of gyms. There's a, reason, there's a reason why everything that's lost is found. I left my wallet at the gym. Oh my gosh, I left my wedding ring at the gym. Guess where it is? Either sitting in a cubby, depending on how expensive it is, or it's sitting in the lost and found. Why? Because people that are doing really hard workouts are not looking to cut corners on their fitness. And if people are doing those hard workouts, they're probably not looking to cut corners in life either. I remember there was a quote on a wall in a gym and it said, if you're cheating in here, you're probably cheating elsewhere in life. And I don't know if I want to stand by that 100%, but when it comes to, hey, if you're not cheating in here, you're probably doing some other good things in life. You're probably not looking to cut corners. It's too hard to. You're putting out too much effort not to. You know, Ed Glassman would say this about the CrossFit Games too. Now we're talking about not just the gym. We're talking about tens of thousands of people all in the same area. Someone will lose a wallet every year. Glassman always said it. Your wallet's going to be found and everything is going to be in it. All your money, all your cards, all of everything. I just want to give a shout out to this. And this has just reminded me. Um, there was a woman, Brittany, when we were, it was during the pandemic and I had 1500 pounds of barbells and plates and collars and disinfectant spray and all this other stuff that we had to do in order to work out because we weren't allowed to go into our gym. The one thing they were like, hey, if you're fit and you're healthy, you're going to be good for this. The one thing that was like the most difficult thing to do but we found a way to do it and we would have multiple classes and they would be filled out. We'd have reserved spots. It was amazing. I loved it. And one day at the track, because it wasn't just us, we would, we would go to the track and we would have our barbells and there'd be other boot camp classes. Um, but Welch's gym would be down there. I remember Christina Morris would have big groups of people down there. There'd be other people that were just random people sprinting on the field. It was actually really, really cool. Because there was no sections, there were no areas that were like, this is ours. 
it was open for everyone. And everyone was there to work hard and none of the coaches or instructors were assholes. There were times when we were running around the track and we had barbells in this area. And if we were setting up and other people were setting up, it's like, hey, what side do you want? Oh, we're going to be over here today. Awesome. Good. Fist bump. And there was, a, there was an, another instructor there. Um, her name's Brittany. And I only know that because I left my wallet in at, just at the track. Wallet there. No cell phone or anything else. Just left it there. And um, right in the corner uh, at, uh, what is it? Uh, Morrissey Park? No. Uh, I don't know how I can't think of this because I had to say it a million times. Joe Moakley. So Joe Moakley Park um, in you know, South Boston, Dorchester area. And I got a direct message on Instagram that said, hey, I found your wallet. <clears throat> um, let me know where you live. Or what. And I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm, I'm in Natick, but I'm, I'm coming into town you know, with, with my daughter, we have a little like daddy daughter day. So we're going to be hanging in town. I'll come, I'll come grab it. Thank you so much. And I got there and there was, she gave me my wallet. I was like, thank you. Uh, didn't, I wasn't going to like look and make sure everything was in there. She had reached out. So I'm sure she didn't take anything. And then, you know, we're going and we're, we're meeting up, uh, maybe some friends to eat and I go to pull out money to pay. And there was, 20 or 40 extra dollars in there. And it had a little sticky note on it that was just like, Hey, you know, have so much fun with your daddy daughter day, you know, have some, have some food on me. I'm an auntie of, of seven people. And then at the end, because it says on my ID veteran, it says, and thank you for your service. And I was like, this person is incredible. I could tell more about that person from writing that note than anything that anyone could tell me about her or that she could describe to me about herself and that she was willing to there the integrity was obviously through the roof to do the you know to do the right thing whether i'm a good person or not whatever it was but to to give something back to the person who lost it but then just just going out of your way to make someone else's day especially during a time when it's not like you know everyone was you know the economy wasn't soaring at this point in time and, and I'll always remember that. And I, and I don't want to relate it directly to fitness, but I want to say, Hey, we're a bunch of people who are out there working really hard, helping other people train to work really hard. And, and there was a, there's a really, really cool thing that came from it. And it, whether I would have done that before, regardless, now it's almost like an opportunity that I would, I want to go out of my way to try to help someone else out. Even if it's, if it's super inconvenient for me, because I remember how that felt. And I remember even my outlook on the world was a little bit different that day. It probably went back to, it probably fluctuated throughout the, uh, the span of the next year, but it was like, Hey, this is, you know, this is caring. This is cool. I bet she's not cutting corners in the gym, I Bet she's not cutting corners in her work there to say, Hey, I have, a, I have a random job and I need someone for it. If she was a person who was looking for a job, I'd be like this person. Why? Well, I don't know, because I would want to be around them and I trust what they, I trust they would do the right thing. And the CrossFit, um, seminar staff is a, it's a pretty intensive internship process. One, it's very difficult to get an internship and two, there's not a lot of guidelines for the internship. And, and three, you have to be able to like take feedback, travel around, you know, work really hard for, um, you know, series of learning different roles with, without a lot of guidelines, at least at that point when I went through and, <coughs> um, the first seminar, the first time that you're there is like the airport rule. That's really all you're judged on. If you were stuck in an airport with this person for 24 hours, how would you feel? And it doesn't matter how smart you are or how articulate you are or, you know, what you're able to accomplish from a, from a fitness and training perspective. But do you think the rest of the team can stand to be around you for that long? Because odds are when you're traveling all around the world, you know, there's 26 seminars every weekend all around the world that everyone is flying to different places and working with different people on odds are that's going to happen. And then from there, it's what, you know, what is your care concern for the rest of the group, for the participants? Not how, how much can you suck up to the other people working? What is your care for the participants? Because that's what matters. 
And then once that, what is your efficacy in being able to teach and see and correct them and improve their quality of movement in these drills? And then once you pass that, there's, you know, there's a a few other things that they look over criteria. You can be recommended for staff. But I think that airport rule is, is is an important thing. And a lot of people that don't cut corners are usually going to pass that unless you're weird. In that case, you're probably also pass. I think at one point in time, it was just, everyone always said it. And it's like, it was, I was, it was from the military and like, Hey, any advice for this first seminar? And everyone would be like, don't fuck it up. And you're like, Oh, okay. But really like, that's what it was. Just like, you know, just don't, you know, don't be an idiot. What are you there for? Why are you doing these things? Where Todd Woodman would always say, one of a, one of the senior mentors on the CrossFit training team, absolute OG, um, Flowmaster, he would always say, are you doing this for you or are you doing this for the participants, them? And that kind of changed the way I did a lot of things. Because I always liked being the funny guy. I always liked you know bringing some humor to, <coughs> to lectures, to small breakout groups. But... Sometimes I had to take the step back and be like, am I being funny for me or am I being funny for them? And a lot of times outside of the course content or material, if I was overdoing something, it was for me. Now, granted, bringing some personality into it isn't the worst thing in the world, but giving everything back to the participants and giving everything back to the people you're coaching, the people you're teaching, that may be a beneficial lesson for those of you who aren't just, you know, worker outers, those of you who are potentially trainers that are potentially working with other people, am I doing this or saying this for me, for my own benefit, or am I doing it and saying it for the benefit of my people? It's just a good checklist. Not to say that, you know, someone else has the right or wrong answer. But if, if you, if you know yourself well enough, like maybe you should ask yourself that question, hold yourself accountable with that question. Well, I feel like I've bounced around a lot here. Um, It's fun to do hard things too. It feels good. It feels good afterwards. I've yet to finish a workout that was really hard and being like, man, I wish I just wouldn't have done that hard thing today. I've definitely regretted certain components of workouts being like, maybe I over-programmed that. For instance, specifically today, Here's a good challenge for you guys. The reason why I love this as a challenge is because it's body weight. There's very, very low risk for like injury. So the safety area is high and uh, the efficiency is probably really, really low because no one was able to complete it and it was just miserable and we all just grinded together. So here's what you're going to do. If you know what a glute ham developer is, a GHD, for some of you, you know it intimately. For some of you, you're like, is that the big, large padded object that everyone sets water bottles on in the gym you're like yeah that thing so the ghd hip extension so you lay flat the pads are on your quads your hip is free of the pad so let's say this your hip right here pew, 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 pew. and a hip extension is you flex while maintaining flexion in your spine so you flex at your hip not at your spine and you essentially just do these Boop, post to your chain workout awesome working the back side of your body your lower back erectors are focused on stabilizing your core your glutes and hamstrings are responsible for flexing you and pulling you through that range of motion. That's one part. The other part, just a Superman hold. So you're just holding the top. So we did Tabata. 20 seconds hold at the top and then 10 seconds of hip extensions for eight rounds. I think four rounds might have been the right call on that because on like the sixth round, I remember I kind of had my eyes closed the whole time and I was like bending my leg. You could hear kind of the GHDs moving around with everyone. And at one point in time, I was like, man, like, I'm, I'm resting right now. I need to be like doing it. And I kind of looked right or left and everyone was resting. Like after that sixth round, there was just no more static hold. The hip extensions were just terrible. We're just trying to hold positions on that one. I was like, yeah, maybe I could have changed that one a little bit, but at the end of it, it was fun. We all kind of walked around like uh, like Ewoks for a little bit. Um, but anyways, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to end it with that. Uh, thanks for tuning in today. We have some uh, we have some awesome guests that are that are coming on that are coming up a couple people in the reserve and trying to get back to consistently getting on here. So if you have any topics that you would like either myself or um, or anyone else to discuss or if you have recommendations for people that that come on board, um, as we all know, I love talking. So I'd love to uh, to pass the mic to other people as well. But 
just want to say thank you for tuning in. Appreciate, um, you know, your listening and your, and your dedication to us, especially if you're listening this far in. Um, and, and again, we will, uh, we'll talk to you soon and, uh, appreciate you as always. Thank you.